I just did the most uncomfortable podcast of my life. It was wonderful. I'll explain. Dr. Shani Verschleiser, who is not just a good friend of mine, she is a trauma therapist, a great trauma therapist, and she runs my Gainu. And we sat down, we talked about how to help kids who are dealing with molestation and other just helping saving kids. So he, she is going to be having a workshop on May 2nd, which you could find them on gainer.org. And I, I think I'm going to go because it sounds fascinating. This was a really wonderful conversation. I will tell you, it took me about a half hour to get into the nitty gritty. Um, if you want to go straight to that, if you have the, the stomach for it, go just skip to around the 30 minute mark where we really got into what's going on in the community and what we could do to help. But you know, some of the stuff was really hard to listen to. I will say this particular podcast, if you, if you have, I guess it's a trigger warning, um, for people who may have suffered from molestation in the past or any type of trauma related to this um, should be just alert that this is we get pretty deep and we talk about some intense stuff also if children are watching i would suggest maybe this is an adult only podcast love you all enjoy it as much as i hello and welcome to the brainstorm podcast and now your host sonny perlman and we're live uh, thank you for coming. I'm going to do a whole intro later, but cool. so okay. I make pretend I already introduced you and everything. Okay. Awesome. And I'm really, really, really grateful that you came all the way up here. You should be grateful. It was a long this drive. Is, it was a long drive. <laughs> yes. And I always say, cause I drive in and out. Rain is worse than snow, worse than anything else. Yeah. Cause I, everybody drives very silly in the rain. They drive silly and then accidents happen and then but in the snow it's a easy it's an easy drive so everybody stays off the road oh, so yeah but it actually wasn't so bad because it was very foggy right so actually the fog felt like driving through like a disney movie well, it was actually nice. <laughs> okay it was cool. yeah. okay we're gonna get off i will tell you the one thing i was gonna say about crisis and i'm curious what you think about it and then we'll get right into your stuff the crisis thing i was saying is that our policy here our village there is no such thing as crisis and for everything else, call it Sala. Mm -hmm. And the belief about this, and be interested in what you think about this, but the belief about this is that if you deal with anything like it's a crisis, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. So you have to you have to go in with uh, this idea that this took a while to get to here. It's going to take a while to get out of here, okay. and um, and we deal with it like that. And 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 if it's really a crisis, call it Sala. Then we call it an emergency. Yeah, yeah that's so that's 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 an emergency. So no emergency, crisis. Right. I you know it's very interesting. Um, I have to think about it. I feel like I feel like it makes sense. It's like a reframe around right, what it right. is. I'm just wondering, um, what are you saying that the emergency versus crisis has to do with what the person themselves is looking at it as? Meaning, if they view it as an emergency, then it's an emergency. Versus I see it as every person involved is is making a mistake when you're looking at it. So you have, let's say, parents involved. They're panicking. We got to do something. Oh, my God. It's crisis, crisis. Then you have the person who's suffering, and that person is like, it's a crisis. The worst thing ever happened, which makes it much worse than it is. And then they're, and they're bugging out about whether they're making it worse or not making it worse. And then the helper is also... You know, like, uh oh, we got to throw her into to, right, to the treatment panic. program, yeah. and this that guy got arrested, and this is you know, it's like everybody panic. is in total panic, freak out mode. Yeah, no, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think um, it's 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 kind of along the lines of thinking about the the parts of people, right? With let's say a part that's suicidal or a part that's cutting or whatever that is. Right. If you're viewing it as a as like the end, so it's the end. If it's if you're viewing it as a part that's trying to communicate something. And then it's not so it's not so scary, right? It becomes not so scary. But I think that that whole concept is a lot of hand holding. You know, when you talk about the parents and all the all the collaterals, you know, most people don't know they don't know this kind of stuff. It's like you literally have to sit and walk them through even the concepts that you're saying right now. Right. Right. Because that and that's a huge that's a huge piece. It's a lot of time. 
Well, what I am finding, this is interesting, and this is bringing it up, because we, before we were talking, we were talking about, like, the mental health world in general and who's qualified, who's not qualified, and all that yeah, stuff. And I hope to, yeah, I really want to get into it, because I know it's your favorite topic, or one of your favorite topics. Um, but what I find is that there are, if you really tap into people's intuition, there's some, some deep therapy there. Yes. I mean, they, they really... When I speak to parents and they're they're freaking out, and they very often they they got what's happening here, even if they don't have any therapeutic language to put it in, or they just they know their kid really well, and they've made a million mistakes. They know a lot of their mistakes. They don't know how to reverse them. They're unconvinced that there's another way, but they know it's they're doing the wrong thing. Right. So I I find that like a like a little bit of psychoeducation. Most parents are not that far off from like. What do you think about that? It, it's a, hmm. it's very interesting. I I I agree and I disagree. I think that that. I think that you're right. I do think that everybody's born with the ability to um to heal themselves. I think that it exists in everybody because I think as a I, I I'm very against people calling themselves healers. You know, there's a whole people a community of people that are like I'm a healer. I don't believe that I'm a healer. I think that we're, I think therapists and people that are helpers are people that hold space for people to do their own healing, right? It's, you're not a healer. Um, and so in that, from that perspective, I totally agree with you. Right. Um, and, 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 ooh, <laughs> she did not say but. No. I like that. Yeah. And I think there are, unfortunately, enough individuals out there who, really um they don't get it and maybe because of their own stuff maybe their own traumas from when they were younger whatever it is and those individuals this kind of way of thinking doesn't actually help the client it actually kind of what kind of way of thinking like this concept of like how they just need a little bit of psycho ed or they really do have it inside of them they really understand their kid my, I mean, and that's just from my own experience in terms of the, my clientele. So it really also is skewed based on who's coming, right? Everybody's thinking is kind right, of based right, on right. who's in front of them. Um, I think there, I think every parent, for the most part, um, does the best they can with what they have. I don't think people decide to mess up their kids, right? I think everybody does the best they can, and we bring our stuff into into our parenting. So, so yeah, there are plenty of people that really do know something's off, they want to change something about it, they're not sure how, and they really are welcome. They welcome help, even if it's tough. Right. But there's also, unfortunately, there's a world out yeah, there Yeah, talk to not. me about, like, what, you, what you're what you saying. You've mentioned this to me in the past also, like, it's something that really bothers you about healers and not, uh, I know Ellie. Yeah, you, my <laughs> husband. Your husband, who I'm very him. close friends yes. with. Um is uh is always yelling and screaming this guy's <laughs> not qualified you know like he's right he's very very uh but i very know passionate. he's very passionate yeah. but i know what does it mean like qualified okay you, you we're gonna t deal with the topic of trauma we're gonna yeah. deal with the topic of molestation and all that mm -hmm. all the good all the stuff. stuff nobody wants to talk about yeah all, by the way i'm totally cringing doing this podcast even though this is a topic i'm so deeply in I'm completely cringy, like, oh, I don't want to talk about it. So You and everybody else. Right. So I'm excited that I'm talking about it. I've done this, you know, in other topics that people get very, like, very icky about, and I, I would like to answer those things. But what's yeah. the deal with qualified, not qualified? <laughs> right. Why Why do you get so up in arms okay, about so this? It's, it's what, okay, so what's frustrating about being in the trauma world, right, being, being, uh, being a trauma therapist and seeing what's out there is that, um, it's like, on the one hand, there's so much information out there. That's great. I right? think about the podcast that we're doing. Everybody can do a podcast now, right? Everybody has something to say. So on the one hand, it's really nice, right? You have a community, you can say your piece, you can learn anything you want, right? You can go, you could do any training you want online. You could do anything, right? And so people have this inner place of like, oh, wow, this is really cool. And then they want to give it, give back and they, they believe they have some kind of skills and maybe they do, maybe they don't, but they're out there. But then there is this piece where when you're dealing with some, so this trauma informed, which I don't even understand what that word necessarily means when people say they're trauma informed, that they know that there's trauma, that they know it exists. They did some reading around trauma, so they're trauma informed. Okay, great. 
when you're sitting with somebody who we're talking about, like, you know, we're talking about some deep trauma, like severe chronic sexual abuse or neglect, physical, emotional, all these pieces that really, really shift a person's life. If you are not getting this foundation, right? Not just like you go in and take a trauma training, but there's a foundational piece around what is happening with each individual person. And I say each individual because everybody's symptoms play out in very different ways. Yes, there are universals. And yes, we read these like the symptoms and all those pieces, but the kind of therapy you bring is really dependent on, on the individual, right? If you don't get good supervision and you're not living in that world of what's happening in front of you, in that person's body, in that person's emotions, in that person's thinking, you're, you potentially can be doing so much more damage. I don't think anybody means to cause damage. I don't think people are out there to hurt people, but they do anyway. They do anyway. It just, it happens all the time. Well, what does that mean, damage? Yeah. yeah what, what, what kind of damage? So... They're already broken, like, hi, right. I'm so, breaking so them more. It's like an, yeah, it's another whole layer. Imagine going into therapy with this whole history that you have to deal with from childhood and adolescence, and then spending the first year of therapy just talking about what happened in your therapy that you were just in the last in the last session, right? Because this person, you know, took some courses in somatic work and took you very deep and couldn't get you out. Or somebody who I know who had um, an EMDR treatment from, from with somebody and Ab reacted and got stuck in a... Uh, in a, in, a, in a memory for an hour and a half and the person couldn't pull them out, right? Because they didn't have the, that other piece of training, right? What bothers me is that just because you go and take a training doesn't make you a trauma-trained therapist, right? Just because you took EMDR doesn't mean that you can treat trauma, right? It means you have a tool, right? right? Just because you're an IFS therapist doesn't mean now everything's open to you. And it's not that you shouldn't take those clients either, but you definitely definitely need a lot of supervision and you need to build, right? So that when you're sitting with the individual person, it's what does this person need right here, right now? And that you could pull out different tools for that specific person. Now, there are people that will be like, listen, um, I practice sensory motor psychotherapy. That's how I work. That's my modality. So if somebody's there, that's how I work. Now, I'm not, I don't learn other things. I like this method. Great, that's great, that's great, good. But if that person is, if it isn't working for that person, are you willing to then say to that person, listen, this is how I work. It's not working for you, right? Let's find you somebody else that has different modalities that might work for you instead of trying to like push your, your piece because that's what you're trained in. Right. Well, I have an interesting thing because actually we have a staff chat and our place and Ellie's on it. And yeah. we had this staff, we had this training guy he came on. He was breath work guy. It was very interesting. And Ellie was like, what's his qualifications? What's his all this stuff? And it got me thinking because, yeah. because I think this is exposing a bigger issue, which is I know plenty of people that have many, many years experience, have great qualifications, did all the therapy, got all the master's degrees and the, PhDs and all that stuff, and they're just as, and, and, yeah, and terrible. they're terrible. Yeah. And then I have people that ha have taken a, a weekend course, and I consider them pretty good at it. Yeah. So now, it. how exactly are we supposed to it's, monitor it's, that? It's like, very, I, I hear you. It's very tough. I think that, that I don't have a great answer for how to monitor. It's, it's, it's really tough. There's no system. I try to tell people, like individual people, when you're looking for therapy, yeah. Um, there are certain things that you have to sort of go into it knowing or, or at least kind of holding space for yourself around what does it feel like to be around that person, right? Um, certain like red flags that might, might kind of be there in terms of like uh, personal things that someone might share or um, maybe the boundaries are a little too rigid, maybe they're a little too porous, like really trusting your gut, um, asking questions around what trainings they, the person has and who's their supervisor. When somebody doesn't have a supervisor, uh, to me, that's a, that is a big red flag. I think everybody needs um, somebody to, you know, kind of have checks and balances around. Um, and so there are certain things that you have to, you kind of have to know walking in. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't. Um, right. Or, or they're, there's I think the of, only one that I, like, that you could really ask out of all those things, because I could sit down with somebody and really click with that person. Yeah. The, the chemistry's right. And that person could be a terrible therapist. True. So I I don't know how much you could trust your gut on these situations. I feel like 
you say they have a supervisor. Okay, let's okay, let's go there. Least, okay, but it's at least a check, meaning right. Meaning at least it's something that you're you're knowing there's accountability, which brings me into that whole piece around when we talk about these concepts of, you know, breath work and coaches and all these pieces. So I have a problem with people that don't have checks and balances. I agree with you. There are plenty of therapists out there that are not great and actually do a lot of damage. Also, doesn't mean that we get a free pass, right? But there's a difference if somebody has a license and they can be reported and there could be some kind of accountability versus somebody where there's no nothing to report to. There's nowhere to there's nothing nothing can happen to that person. I feel like in order to be reported, you gotta do something pretty horrific. Like it's I mean, like I'm, this person just doesn't know how to get me out of an ENDR. No, like, but that memory. you wouldn't report. That's not There's nothing to report. No, no, that's but not a, I'm not, I'm probably not. most of the damage is happening at that level. Like if somebody yeah. is a coach I've dealt with a coach um, down in Florida who, like, was inappropriately touching women and stuff. I don't know if I spoke to you about this one. I don't remember. Really terrible. Totally got away with all of it. Incre right. Incredible. Still getting away with it. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, and, like, you know, they reported him. It was, like, it was like to do about it. Like, he has, like, a following, and th those people yeah. go to him, and yeah. that's it. It's, yeah, it's scary. So I don't know the reporting. I, I just, I, I hear it's your very, problem. It's tough. It's very tough. I, I, listen, there's no easy answer to this question, but the openness of everything now brought this really um, beautiful place, but it also opened up so much uh, potential damage, right? Even the, like these ceremonies, I know you're a big yeah, fan yeah. of these ceremonies. Big fan of big ceremonies. Fan. You guys got that? <laughs> <laughs> big fan. Big fan of ceremonies. I have lots of thoughts about the ceremonies. Right. That is the best way to say about it. Okay. So, some positive, some yeah, negative. Right. So, you know, in the Jewish community, yeah. right, there are these concepts where the latest kind of the latest topic comes in, right? Like somatic came in and everybody's you know, doing somatic and then you know, comes in uh, ayahuasca, everyone's doing it. MDMA, academy now, breath work, right? It's like the thing of the time. Right. Now, I don't, I'm not against ceremonies in the sense that they could be really powerful. It's almost, to me, it feels almost like going to a concert or going to like a, like a basketball game. You know that feeling when you're with a bunch of people and everybody's sort of in the same mindset? There's something really nice about it. It's like yeah. a, a really nice feeling of a belonging place. Right. And it's really nice. But what I have, what I struggle with is when somebody is coming from a place of I'm really, I need something. I'm stuck. I hear this is good. Let me go try it. And it's like, okay, great. You know, let me go try it. And somebody's there willing to just take you in, right? Yeah, because I do this and this is how it goes. Great. And you have this room full of people. Some of this stuff is very, very, um, it's, it could be very dangerous. You go very deep. And if you're not with somebody who can hold you, hold space for that, help you through whatever's coming up, or um, you don't even know what's coming, what is, what might be lurking there, those things feel scary to me. Right. Well, let me ask you a question because actually, a good yeah. friend of mine, Menachem Poznanski, who I've had on a bunch of times, so you know very well. Um, sure. We're all in the same organization <laughs> yes. somewhere. somewhere. Um, Link. All the different legs of this organization, um, but. So Menachem is very anti, uh, you know, psychedelics. I mean, he, he's very deeply in the recovery world. I'm also deeply in the recovery world, but I'm somewhere on the fence and okay. makes me a little controversial. Um, but, you uh, love. what? You love it. I think I love it. Yes, I do. I think you're not wrong about that. <laughs> um, it's a little extra perk. It's like the... Yeah, yeah, I get it. <laughs> the, the sprinkles on the top or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, cherry on top is what I want to say. But <laughs> Menachem has also said to me that he's really had... He's had situations where people have gone to ceremonies and really like went into psych episodes and this. Have you experienced that also I or have. just... Yes, I have. Okay. I, have. I had um, somebody just recently who... So here, so here's the piece, right? These are the these, this is where the trauma training comes in, and the concept of these of what's going on today. The, I had somebody who could not recover any memory, right? We know that there was definitely cult abuse in the history, um, but couldn't recover any any memories. They're blocked. Okay, bunch of somatic symptoms, really, really awful. Okay, now from my world. There is a reason why those memories are blocked. 
We don't push the system when memories are blocked like that because there is an entire system that was built for this individual around making sure that he can go through his life and function in life, right? His system is protecting him. Now, does that mean that he'll never recover the memories? It doesn't. It just means that when his brain and his body are ready, that's when things will start to come. And that could take, it, we're looking at a 10-year process of therapy when we think about somebody like that, right? The first year alone is just feeling okay in the room with the therapist. What is it like just to be in this room, just to sit on this couch, to be in, to land in my own system and slow down? That could be a year, right? The next year is about, you know, the functioning around resources. What do I, do, what can I do for myself to help myself through life outside of the therapy room to feel okay, right? All these things are, we scaffold to, to get to the point where the person can then, potentially, the brain might be ready to open something. But instead, there's a frustration, and, and the therapist, I wasn't me, frustrated around nothing's coming up, whatever. Right. So, so the person asks, you know, should I just go do some, what, does MDMA therapy, all this kind of stuff? So sure, I'm like if that's something that you want to do, right? I'm not going to stop you, which I understand from the therapist also. Like I'm not going to stop you because you want to do it. Right. Although I probably would have said, I don't advise it. I don't think it's a good idea, but went. And everything came down. All the walls came down, bypassed the entire protection Which is system, how it works. Which is how it works. All the memories came in. And Do you know what they were using? Do you, do you know? I don't know? Okay, fine. I don't know. But it was, a, it was an example where it was awful. And it's still awful and it's beyond awful. And now we're trying to say, how do you put this person back together around not only now. It's uh, awful because she, what? It's awful because the, all the memories, the, his whole system mm -hmm. was not ready to know all that stuff. And so what happens in that moment is the entire system, all the parts that, that decided, right, that he, that he shouldn't know, now were obliter obliterated, right? And those parts now are mad. Not only, not only now are all the memories there, but the parts are mad, right? Like that you bypassed me. Right. And so now there's a whole slew of new symptoms and agony and pain and body pain. I mean, you know, everything went from here to here, right? If it was bad enough, now it's really, really bad. And that's one example. Right. I'll tell you another example of a breathwork session where in the ceremony, right, this person had a, a memory that came up around sexual abuse and totally left left their body, right? Now, you know, in that moment, if somebody has no idea what that means, if it's somebody who's just doing breathwork sessions and they're not trained and how to, how to help somebody sort of come back and you don't even know the questions to ask, that person could easily end up in, in, the, in the hospital that same night, right? These things happen. Right. So it's not that the ceremonies don't have potential to be good. It's not that psychedelics don't have the potential to help. It's how are you doing it? What are the contraindications? You know, I spoke with somebody who specifically does psychedelics. That's their thing. I don't want to say the name. And I had a whole meeting around, help me understand it. And then my question was, what are the contraindications? None. Everyone could, everyone could do it. It doesn't make so much sense to me, right? What about this? What about, yeah, but that, but this, everything was, right? when someone says there's no contraindications, I, I right away can't trust them because there's no such thing. Nothing is good for everybody. That's true. That, well, that is true. But would you say, let's say, having a good support system is not good for everyone? Yeah. <laughs> no, what yeah. I'm saying is like... Yeah. I, but having a good support system... Will it save you? Not no. necessarily. And having a good support system is a, is a sense of belonging. Yes. Right? Okay, so a sense of belonging is good for everyone. Right? I'm talking about... I'm talking from the, the, the therapeutic perspective, the modalities, the introducing different things. Like, I, I'm trained in breath work, right? right? Um, and I will, I will not do breath work with certain clients, right? I'm trained in breath work right. and I'm a trauma, I'm a trauma trained. And I have to tell you that it's very scary. I can have somebody in my office go, you know, get lost in a child state memory and really believe that they're somewhere else. And that I have no fear about. I, um, I can, I can pull them back. We're in it, but in breath work, things can be really scary because you don't have, you know, you don't have that much, um, wh wherever the person is, you have to, you're not really knowing what's happening. Right. You have to be really careful. And some of this stuff takes you in, into a, like a hypnotic state, and hypnotic states for people that are very dissociative are researched to be not not healthy. Right. They make the dissociation worse. So if you're doing a ceremony and your requirement is just that you want to be have a healing experience with the community, that is not enough of of understanding why this person is walking into your room. I, you know, if you're a if you're a breath worker, a body worker, a, a, a life coach, 
and you're saying, okay, let me do this ceremony, and everyone's just walking in, but you don't know if that person has a therapist that they're going back to after this, and you don't know if they're DID or DDNOS, right, any dissociative disorders, and you don't know that they're just doing it to uncover memory, which is not a reason to do this. You do not do these things to uncover memory. It's a bad idea. Right. You don't do any of those history or research, then you shouldn't be, you should not be taking that person in. But, you know, it's, we do. It's interesting because my own experience in my life is I, I haven't, I'm, even though I like to be a little controversial, I live a pretty normal life and I have done it, um, but very, very infrequently. This idea, like, you know, psychedelics, like uh, every decade, you know. Right. Okay. So it's not, but it has a trans. It has had a transformative effect on my life, and and it continues to, which is fascinating. And I never want to do it again, honestly, because the last one was so painful. I just I don't want to do it again. Right. But it's still having transformative effect. It is beautiful. So and a friend of mine had come to me recently, and and I'm not. I never recommend this to anybody because it's illegal. But if you want to go to Costa Rica, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. If you wanted that experience, but. Um, just on the the bigger picture, there's a couple of things I want to talk about. One is even bigger than this because it's something you said before. But on the bigger picture, who is eligible to go to this? There really is like two that I that I recommend. I'm realizing, and and the counter indicator, like I'll talk about what I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, there are two. One is like total emergency mode. Someone is just literally living a chaotic life forever. No therapy's working, nothing's working. They, they really just like in middle of addiction. They, they're just in the worst place. They haven't done anything that works at all. They're not stable at all. What I have found is some level of psychedelics could do the wake up call to get them started. And I've been fairly successful with that in the past. Okay. Then there's a huge leap. <laughs> this is what I believe to people who are living fairly very healthy lives with a family and a community and all that stuff everything is put in place mm -hmm. but they and they've been doing the therapy it's getting them somewhere and they want to just like majorly open it to them which would be me which w was my case okay. um and like open places that really kind of like the protectors have been staying there because they're used to staying there Right. But you're healthy enough that you could tell the protectors to hop down for a night and yeah. then you could come back. You're not going to fall apart. Okay. It's the middle guys, and that's most of the world probably. It's the middle guys. Not only is it most of the world, it's most of the world that's showing up to these things. Right? Like, like, I, like I, if you're not stable, just let me finish. It's yeah, not stable, but I'm, no, I'm saying if you're not stable and you're doing this, that's where I see it's an issue. But the issue I'm having is not the same issue as you. Yeah. My issue is that it makes you feel so good for the night that you keep coming back right. to it, oh, thinking it's the, the answer. Tony Robbins effect, I call it, right? The Tony Robbins effect. I think it's very similar to Tony okay. Robbins, the so, whole thing. So I have a problem with Tony Robbins effect and, and him in general, right? Because it's the same kind of thing, right? You go to something, you feel amazing. You work, you feel amazing. And then you go home and life goes back and the work is not being done. And then you're always seeking that next thing. So I paid a thousand dollars for this weekend. I'll get a discount the next time I go for eight hundred dollars, but I'm I'm running back, right? Right. And that is a, that's a real problem. And by the way, I I I did I do breath work, and I've done breath work myself. I haven't done um, psychedelics, but I did um, I do breath work on myself with you know with somebody who does it for me. And I agree with you. It's transformative. It's changed my my world. I have the same piece. Married. I have kids. I'm stable. I've done my own therapy for years. Certain pieces that were stuck. Breath work did it. It's great. Right. I agree with you. However, you and I, right, we have so much work behind us of other things, and we got, we're got we at a place where we hit those points that we were looking for something a tiny bit deeper, right? It wasn't the place of, I, I need to, I need, a, I need something quick. I need to, I want to just do something. This is like, oh, everyone's saying how amazing this is, and I, I, I really have been struggling, or I, I'm sort of like not okay, so let me just try this. When they don't even really have any foundation. You know, I think about some of the clients that I see. You know, I, have a, I had a client, more than one, but one's coming up for me specifically, where I spent six months, the first six months of therapy, of treating her, facing the wall literally just noticing how, how it was like just to sit across from each other and how being seen for her was just awful. I mean, she was facing the wall. I, I would turn my chair and face the wall. 
For six months, our therapy consisted of literally noticing what it's like when I tore it a tiny bit, a tiny bit. A t- my heart's picking up. Great. Notice your heart picking up. Let's take a deep breath. Put one hand on your heart, right? Little tiny drops, six months, okay? Until I was able to face her and it was comfortable. And then the next piece and the next piece and the next piece. You know, four and a half years later, I'm proud to say she's married. She's doing amazing. Different person, like right. different person. Now, somebody may be, well, you, sh- you know, if she would have gone to psychedelics, it would have snapped at. I don't believe that at all. I think this was an entire a process that had to be scaffolded. Could she go to something now? Maybe now she can go into something and see where it takes her. And even that, I wouldn't do ceremony one on one. Somebody who is trauma trained also and is doing that also to help whatever it is that's there, mm. right? But these are very these are human beings with you know psyches and sy- symptoms and systems. It's it's very scary to put everybody into a room and be like, let's just do a session for everybody, and it's so amazing, and we'll see what happens because it's not so amazing all the time. Yeah. Well, the bigger picture that I have, the bigger question that I have is I feel like all these ceremonies and the breath work and all these new age, new things that are popping up, they're not new age. They were back in the 60s, too. Like, it's not like this. Yeah, it's yeah. not our first psychedelic <laughs> right. revolution, I say. Right. You know, don't get so excited. The 60s people didn't turn out so great. <laughs> anyway, don't get that excited. I, I love those 60s. Relax. On the 60s. Where are the children of the people who went through the 60s? I'm not sure. I don't know. The music's pretty good. The music's fantastic. Okay, so the question really is, is that I feel like all this stuff coming out, you were saying like, especially in the Jewish world, we're like always looking for the new age thing. Isn't it exposing a much bigger thing where people are not getting better? Like they're going to a lot of therapy. There's a lot of therapy happening. I, I speak to... Um, this organization here achieved that they have they see 5,000 people in the Jewish community a year. Now, I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means like in a classroom setting, some of them, but that's 5,000 people in Muncie. I don't know how many people are in Muncie, but like that's like, I don't know, it's a lot. Yeah. 25% of Muncie is being seen by right. Achieve, you know. So, all that being true, yeah, like why is everybody running to ceremonies and this and that? I, I, well, I feel like it's exposing that there's a, there's a, there's a bigger flaw here. For sure. Well, so, okay, we can get, one of the things I think, or I, I talk, I, I think, and I, if I get into this thing, I get like a little crazy, but I'll try not to get so crazy. I, uh, I believe. I would love to see you go yeah, crazy you, on my pod. It'd be okay. so viral. Yeah. It'd be amazing. <laughs> no, I tell you what, I, <laughs> what I believe is that, um, if we would invest more in 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 unborn children, right? Meaning from the time moms are pregnant, mm-hmm. we would have much less coming out later. I think that we don't, and I think by the way, not this is not just about the Jewish community. I think this is about the world at large. Right. I think we're constantly putting band aids on things, and it doesn't work. I think that if we took all, a, like huge huge resources and invested in understanding and helping young moms, okay, understand what it is to be carrying a baby from the time the baby's in utero, what that baby is absorbing, what everything that we do as human beings goes into that child, how they how how important that job is, how like you are like the entire world is resting on you right now, explaining to men how important it is to take care of that part, like that woman when she's carrying your baby and what that is, what that you're doing to that kid when you yell, when you scream, when you make somebody feel bad or whatever it is, and then continuing that for the first year of life. What happens when you look at that baby in their eyes? What happens when you count their little fingers and toes? What happens versus what happens when you're nursing and you're holding your phone, okay, and that baby's slowly turning to see What's mom looking at? To be fair, nursing could get boring, I'm assuming. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Phones are so interesting. They are so interesting. They're but so interesting. unfortunately, I'm not getting infants, the phone topic right. with you. I've, I've, done, I've done that before. We're not going there. No, but infants, infants, right? They're, they're, all they're needing is to be mirrored, right? To be mirrored, to know. Okay, so, I, so I'm yeah. definitely pushing back on this because cool, here's right. the deal. I've, I've been raising kids for several years oh, now. Have you? Yes. I have been. Yeah. My daughter just turned 24, so Woo! I think I mentioned this on every pod because I'm so, I'm like, I'm shocked and proud at the same time. I'm like, what? Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, really old. Good. So I've been raising kids. Yes. And my experience has been that 
one thing I really figured out is two people just isn't enough people to raise a kid. And I know we have that, you know, there's a, there's a reason why we say cliche is because they're true. Yeah, and it place. takes a village, yeah. right? And that's what we call it, our village here and yeah. our village shirt. I see. And um, when you're in the middle of saying this to me, I'll just tell you, just tell you what my body's feeling. Cool. Triggered as hell. I'm like, I'm like, it's just all on me. I, I, you, you, I gotta right. fix you're it. I gotta, I got in utero. I'm like, I, I'm just trying not to smack my kid. I'm just trying my best. That's, that's I tried my right, so best. You're in defense mode, which is how all parents get. No, but I'm saying is like your answer is be good parents. No, that one second. We're not disagreeing. Well, my defense we're heard not. that. That's what I heard. I heard nothing else. I know. So we're You're not, like, we're you not. stink as parents. Be better parents. I'm like, I, I was God good. Forbid. Listen, we all, I'm a parent as well. Don't forget. What do you yeah. think, kids, right? I mean, come on. I'm, this, I'm in the same boat as you. I do, we're not disagreeing. I agree with you. It takes a village. I agree with you that two parents are not enough. Years ago, there was no such thing as a two parent situation with just their kid. We lived in communities together. If we're lucky, two parents right. nowadays. Right. 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 And. I agree with you a thousand percent. We're not disagreeing. What I'm saying isn't that the parents are solely responsible for how that child turns out. I'm saying that because parents don't know what a beautiful job and what they could be doing. And when I say parents, I'm talking about the, the whole of parents. Because if you as a parent, right, understand how crucial that child is, you're also going to treat your neighbor's child and the kid down the street and everybody in the same way. But we don't have that mindset, especially when it comes to the concept of Peru, you know, having as many kids and right, all this right. kind of stuff. Well, I you mean, can make a village. Yeah, but think about <laughs> the, the, but think about what happens, right? When and and again, this isn't about judgment. I, everybody makes their own decisions. But imagine a parent, a mom who's you know barely twenty five and has five kids under the age of four, five you know five kids under, under the age of five, and you're. Right. And you're trying to give every kid what they need, and you're doing the best you can, and you love your kids, right? There's always going to be a kid that's not going to get what they need. Now, does that mean you shouldn't have them? I'm not getting into that discussion because right. that's not my place. But, but there's no concept, there's no education around what actually happens in that kid's brain, what actually is going on in that first year of life, what what does it mean to have that connection, that bond? What does that actually mean? What, what does it do for that child, right? If, ch it's, if there are studies, they've done this in other countries where they follow kids through a first year with the moms, supporting them, helping them through, there's your village, right? Helping them be um, supported in what they need with this child, helping them have time with them, you know, putting that time in where they don't have to worry about the other things of their life that are taking over. And those kids, there's less ADHD when they enter schools. There are less problems later on. It's just... It's just how children are, right? That's how children are. They are, they, it's not that it's parents' fault. We don't even know what to do. How could it be our fault? Okay, well, I, I'm saying that parents aren't enough, but okay, we, we'll, <laughs> I'm not even disagreeing. Parents, I agree with everything kid, you're saying. But, but parents, as the collective parent, you being a parent for every kid that walks through your door is you being a parent, right? right? They have parents, but you're also a parent. Well, I'm part of the village. Okay. I like to see myself as the uncle. I like being an uncle. Oh, God, the creepy uncle. Not the creepy yeah, uncle. I'm joking. That moves Uncles me have gotten a bad rap. Yeah, that's true. But that moves <laughs> For me, a good into, reason. by the way, into the other part of my world, which is... Can we go back is, in? Yeah. Can we go into that world? Yes, the sexual <laughs> abuse world. I have to tell you that I believe that this is a communal piece in terms of the parents, meaning all mm -hmm. parents, all adults. And I actually, I'm saying parents, but it's actually the wrong thing. I actually take that back. It's not parents, because even if you don't have children, you're still a parent to kids in your world. You don't have to have kids to be a healthy adult. Healthy adults have to learn what to do and how to treat kids in order to protect all kids, right? It's not about parent-to-child conversation. It's about everyone together knowing development, knowing what children are needing, and then showing up in that way. That's the biggest protective factor. It's the biggest protective factor because people are actually not getting, uh, I mean, I need more words than molested, but... yeah. Other words, assaulted, assaulted. on some level, yeah. um, because the parents are aware. Can we, can we just? Yeah, let's, can we just yeah. let's get in because. Yeah. Um, it's always it's it's fun. I speak to my sister of a guy. She's got like the data like for her topic, which is mainly ADHD. 
Um, she, although she knows tons more. But, like, I love talking to her because I get the actual data. Like, there's a lot of things being thrown around. I love talking to you for, like, you'll have, you have at least some of the data on your fingertips, I think. Yeah. More than anybody else I know. So what? Let, let's talk about sexual molestation. Like, yes. actually, Pesach is coming up. People going to hotels and stuff. It's not a bad timing to, like, discuss Perfect this topic. Yeah. yeah. Um, but in general, I never really brought up this topic. Now, to say the work I do the prevalence of people that have gone through sexual trauma is through the roof. Now, the, the actual, maybe you give me the actual numbers, but my experience, it's almost everybody. Yeah, it's right. really almost that's everybody. What it, that's what it feels like, right? Yeah. No, no, no. It really is almost everybody. It doesn't, it's not a feeling. Most of the guys that go through all the addiction programs and yes. addiction, addiction is a very high level of trauma response often. Yes. So usually it's not, it's not at all rare to have a situation where in if you have addiction, it's a good chance that you, there's some sexual trauma in your history. Okay. It's almost an exception if you're not. So in that sense, I definitely see the, the results, but how prevalent is it? I mean, for me, it's like 90% of the people getting molested. That, you know what I'm saying? Like, cause I, you know, like you said before, like you are, you know, I'm, I'm watching what I have. Right, but right. what are the actual numbers for boys, girls? Could you break this down a little bit for me? So, so yeah, it's a great question. Um, okay, so let's think about it in terms of the numbers that we have in terms of the secular world, because that's the numbers. Yeah. It's one out of four girls, one out of six boys. Whoa, whoa, whoa slow down, slow down. Sorry. I'm like, I, okay. I was a middle child. I talk very quickly. You're just like, boom, yeah. I'm also a middle child. Oh, are you? Okay. I just got the attention seeking oh, thing. I, oh, okay. The, um, <laughs> yeah, I just talk really quickly. Just talk really quickly. Sure get it in. It's like, yeah. please listen to me. Yeah. Okay, exactly. I got it. So similar. <laughs> that was the breathwork session. Yeah. And so <laughs> one out of four girls. One out of four girls, what? Are one out of four girls and one out of six boys are sexually abused before they turn 18. Now, what is that including every single thing like if that we experience? Like, what do you is, mean when you say that? Meaning, if if uh, if you play doctor at, at four years old, is that sec Would did everybody in that party? Like another four year old. They're all four one? years old. No, no, is that, that included? No, no, no. That's what's, what's included in that so, statistic. So sec so. Then we're talking about the definition of sexual abuse, right? Which is very tough. So let's give a warning, right, for people listening, right? If it's it's not easy. This is not easy to. If they made to. it through thirty minutes already <laughs> before what? we even talked about it, it's your fault. Okay, sorry. It was coming the whole time. Well, it is coming, and the bottom line <laughs> is, is that it's something that people should uh, take care of themselves while listening to, because it's not easy. This is not. Easy. Well, I should give you a warning. If a kid is listening, stop listening. Stop listening. Yeah, and if, even if an adult survivor is listening, right, take time to uh, ground yourself. And if it's too tough, don't. Okay. Um, okay, so sexual abuse, we're thinking about... Or go to a ceremony, and then you'll be better. Or don't go to a ceremony. I'm just kidding. Keep okay. going. Very funny. All right. That's <laughs> <laughs> not... Okay. okay. Um, basically, so sexual abuse would be um, defined as if an adult or somebody, right? We're like we're talking about uh, there's a differentiation in power or at least three years of age. I'm going to break that down a little bit. Um, uh touches a child, um, shows them pornographic images, um, has that child touch them for the sexual gratification of the other person, the person doing it, that is the definition of sexual abuse, right? Okay. It's, it's, it's like a kind of broad, kind of not, okay? I just want to say gross. Gross. Okay, sorry. Yeah. It is gross, I know. So it's very interesting, by the way, this, this whole, I do sexual abuse prevention work, and a lot of my clientele are survivors, and... Um, one of the reasons why I keep doing this, I'm like, and I'm in it, is because I really don't, like I'm at this point where I can talk about this and do this without, with, with being totally okay, even though obviously there are, I have my moments, which is why I feel like whatever God gave me, this is like why I'm doing this, because I can, and not everybody can. No, Yeah. most yeah. people can't. Most people can't, right. So, yeah, I mean, just so, me listening to it, even, and I'm in it. I'm deeply in it. Right. Just listening is like, I got, like, creepy crawlies all over me. Right. So, so this is why it's so difficult for people to talk so about So one this. out of four. Yeah. One out of four. And remember, we're saying one out of four girls and one out of six boys, and these are the reported cases. Let's not forget that. They have the numbers based on cases that are reported. That means... Because we know that most people do not report, right? Most people, 
the numbers are probably much higher because we just don't know, right? Right. So we're thinking about, and then the question I get every single time is, well, isn't it, is it different for the Jewish community? Because that's the secular numbers. So how do we compare it to what we, to what we know? It's like every, every, every time, every, everywhere I go. I'm glad you said it before me. I don't want to be like those people. I know. You answer before I say it. So (laughs) honestly, it's, there's no difference, right? We like we like to think there's a difference because we have all these more this moral code that we follow, and you know we're better, but there's no difference. Um, we don't have enough studies. They're starting to get a little more. We have at this point in time, I think we're about four or five studies in on different topics in this world that mm. I that I follow, um, but we're getting you know it's becoming easier to research. So so that's what's happening, which is nice, but. You know, just from what the research we do have and just anecdotally from everybody that works with this topic, the numbers are the same. The way it manifests might be different, meaning the secular world might have more uh, teenage pregnancies. You know, they have more um, potentially sexually transmitted diseases that come from this piece, right? That happens more often. But in our world, we'll have, for example, we'll say they'll say less boys are abused in the secular world. In our world, I believe more boys than girls are abused. I'll tell you why. Um, based on the fact that, yes, there are female molesters. They exist. We cannot rule them out at all. And they're increasing as time goes on. But most molesters are still, at this point, male. And in our cultures, we separate the sexes. So there's just more availability from, from men to boys. So in our world, we might have more male victims than female victims, even though statistically that's not the case. Um, but incest is super high. Um, sibling sexual abuse is super high. Right. Um, you know, Can I ask a question to break yeah. it down? And this is, I don't know if this is a relevant question, because I'm assuming that, you know, post-puberty, there's a lot of reporting going on of, like, uh, situations where, you know, you'd have an older teenager and a younger teenager and um, that are probably reported. Are there statistics pre-puberty of the numbers like break breaking it down you're breaking saying? it down like is it one in four till the age of 12 or is they it don't, they don't do that they, they don't, don't do that because no. is they there a difference 18. like when let's say someone is um like they for me is a difference because children are much more hurt like when i deal with people that have um, you know their molestation or any of the trauma happened really young and they don't have any resources to deal with it, and they didn't have family to help them with it, and all that stuff. You know, if something happens, a person developed a pretty decent life, and then at 14, something happened. It's, to me, it's different. Right. And I, I, I know it's still disgusting, and I'm, I'm not a fan. Yeah. But, I'm, but in terms of, like, trauma work, like, right. the younger you are, the, more, the worse it is. I will, so I, I'm yeah. wondering how much, how that breaks down, but you don't really have a breakdown. The breakdown in terms of numbers, no. But um, we do know just based on any any kind of traumas, right? The younger the younger a person is, the, you know the the I don't I don't like to say the deeper the trauma or the bigger the trauma because it's in, you know in no way minimizing the trauma for teenagers, right? Um, but yeah, it it definitely it definitely sits in a different place. Um, but you know there are plenty. It also remember it depends on the on the teenagers also, right? There are so many factors in terms of developmental level. Um, what their awareness is. Think about a 14-year-old, 15-year-old kid who, you know, especially in our, a lot of, a lot of the, our communities that are very sheltered and are really, really not exposed at all, for a kid like that, really when we think about what happens developmentally in abuse, it's almost the same kind of reaction as a younger kid. Right. Right? So it really depends. Okay, so let's go down to that. Okay. I don't know how relevant that question was because I, it's really hard to gauge people's trauma levels, and I wasn't right, trying to really minimize remember, it on yeah. any level. I yeah. mean, no, I understand what you're saying, and it is something that people think about in terms of like, is it really? I mean, look, think, look at the look at the media, right? right. In the secular media, if a boy gets gets abused by a female adult, right, and a 14, 15 year old, you hear constantly, right? Oh wow, lucky him, he's so lucky, right? Like, oh, I wouldn't mind being molested by that person. I mean, this happens all the time. Yes, and it's completely. Um, it's awful for that for the for that kid, right? And and that's why boys don't come forward most of the time, right? If it's a female, that's the reaction, and if it's a male, and then there's all concerns about sexuality and what brought this on. So boys definitely will be much less likely 
to talk about this. Right. And come forward. Because, you Can know. you just, I don't know how you describe this, but like, let's say I'm complete novice. Don't know anything about this. Walking in saying, okay, someone got molested. I actually, <laughs> there was actually a situation where, where somebody who didn't know anything about this had said to my wife, Damn, we were all molested, but like, like you know, like just get over yeah, it. get over it. What do you like? And I actually thought it was a fantastic. It was it was a fantastic attitude. I, I liked it because it was coming from a different world. But I always like when someone's like, uh, you know, shrug it off type of people. They're fun people to hang out with, but sometimes not so fun. But anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna it was a funny you. interaction for me. Yeah. But. I'll go on record as Let, saying I disagree with that statement. Okay, go on record. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course, yeah. the get that in. I Someone can't. put that on record. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, they're, they're fun. They just I find them to be really fun conversations because you're dealing with someone who's like from a different planet than you and you got to try to find a way to connect, which is fun for me. But anyway, it <laughs> doesn't mean they're right or wrong. It's just fun. Okay. Um, I love having conversations. That's what that's what well, I got a I, podcast I you, for. That individual, though, that guy might be hurting some people. Now, yeah, because you don't know who he's sitting with, and it happens a lot. All the right? time. I yeah. understand. I understand. Uh, and I got to work on my humor because sometimes I throw out jokes that like totally is going to hurt people, and then I don't even realize it until about a week later when they tell me that right. we check can't, themselves. So we can't in. be. We can't tiptoe on everything, but I think that um, at a topic like this, because there's such a lack of education. I think people really, I, I don't, I don't think they really don't get it. Like, no, so hold really, on. So yeah. let, let me ask the question. The question is this. Yeah. What actually happens? Like what, what exactly would, you know, so, you know, like, so you got, you got molested as a child, yeah. boy, girl, yeah. uh, maybe for a period of time. Right. Like what happens to actually damage oh. this child? Like well, what, what, what exactly is really happening? Idea. Such a great question. Okay. It's, a, it's a really tough answer because it's, right. it's multiple levels, right? So let's let's think about it. Okay. Okay. Let's just first think about it from a basic place of first of all, who's doing the molesting, right? There's a there's a there's a difference when a child gets molested outside of the family versus somebody that is inside of their family. Okay. There's a right away difference if it's somebody that's it's happening from inside a, a parent, uh, a close, you know, a sibling, somebody that they are they are relying on to take care of, especially a parent, right? Which is way more common that it's inside the family, right? Right. Oh, okay, yeah, that's on. most of the cases. We're talking right. about over 60%. Right. So if that happens, number one, there's an entire place of now what? How do you how do you trust, right? Because all of a sudden, there's something different now in this relationship. It's secretive, clearly, right? Which means automatically, let's say, for example, someone's being hurt by a parent. They have to now keep the secret from the other parent. Okay, so not only do they now lose relationship with this parent who's hurting them, they now have to keep away from the parent that's not hurting them so that they don't they can't tell. So there's a whole way where now the child, think of, forget put the molestation aside for a second, then think about a child who doesn't who's in a home and has to pretend that they are something, right? And also now has no one to rely on. You can't be authentic because you have to. You're always on that in that place of hiding, right? Okay. Right. So that is a world. We could talk about that for hours, right? The world of what happens to a kid who has nobody to, can't rely on their parents. Right. right? The other piece becomes around um, the sexual sexual piece, right? Sexuality and development in terms of sexual um, feelings, there's a reason why they come in at certain times of our life, right? That when we're ready developmentally, God planned it a certain way. And when sexuality gets opened up too early, it's like the faucet gets turned on, but you can't you can't just turn it off. It's not like you could just you now stop it. So there's a whole way of, of chemical reactions and things that happen in someone's body that now are there before the child is ready. Okay, so just from a physical place, it's too much. Am I allowed to talk freely on this kind of this yeah, thing? Yeah, please okay, talk so freely. Again, so, so we already gave our warning. Warning. Okay, warning again. Warning. <laughs> okay, let's think about just like the concept of sex. Right when somebody hits a point of orgasm, right there's a, it's a very intense feeling. A child's body cannot handle that feeling. Okay, now that and little kids' bodies will be pushed to that limit. There are predators that will specifically do that, and it's a feeling that they cannot handle. Right, it's way too big. So the when the brain has to go through some of this stuff and the body, right, there's a way that the brain then sort of goes away. 
I can't be there. That's where we get the dissociative parts from. I can't, I can't be in my body right now. This is too, either too scary, too much, too overwhelming. And so there's a way now that I'm going away. Now, once dissociation sets in. Explain the dissociation. Okay. So dissociation is actually a real gift. It's a real gift. It's, it causes a lot of stuff later on, but it's a great, it's a, it's a real gift um, that God has created our brains to do, right? Where when something feels too overwhelming or too big to the point where there's a, it almost feels like a life threat, like if I stay in my body right now, I will die, right? Then there's an automatic place of just kind of leaving. And so the, the, you'll hear very oftentimes from survivors that they almost have a uh, way of kind of they're watching themselves. They were in a corner of a room watching themselves be hurt. They were on the ceiling looking down at themselves or they weren't even there, right? They're, they weren't even in They weren't even in the room like where that's where the fragmented memories come from. Most of the time, um, there won't be chronological order of this happened, then this happened, then this happened because the part of the brain that you know organizes memory goes offline during these events. So you don't have a place to put it. Um, which is another whole factor of sexual abuse, right? Like this whole piece of somebody, I mean, I, it, it's very hard. This is a tough topic, but think about a child, okay? And think about an, an adult or older person and think about what their face looks like during these kinds of things. There is a very, very scary way this comes at a child. Um, very oftentimes kids will be afraid of, uh, of costumes, perm masks. I had a kid I worked with once, terrified of masks. Perm was her scariest holiday i mean to think about that is like the saddest thing yeah. terrified because the the face the face the tongue hanging out the face it's looks it's like a scary scary place so you can't stay in that world at that time you have to leave so that that's when we have these parts that start to break up right once dissociation is you know it happens and happens and it happens now it happens when you're not even wanting it to happen it's just sort of the way these kids start to function and they sort of compartmentalize their life. I can't get up and go to school and, and, you know, have my regular day with my friends and be regular and also know that when I come home at night, this is what's going on for me at home. So therefore they are two separate people. That person does that. And this person does this. Right. right. And that's how, that's how they live their life. So that's like, um, that's just like a tiny piece, right? Take it further. Think about the concept of relationship. How can you have a relationship with anyone if you can't, if you're not, if you don't even know who you are and you can't be completely yourself and you can't be honest and you're terrified someone's going to get too close? There's always going to be a distance. Interpersonal relationships are going to be really tough. As you get older, it's going to be really hard. With the trust factor as the well. The trust factor, right. Um, memory like this gets stored in a very different way than other kind of memories. So it's like right brain where everything comes up in terms of, uh, you know, sounds and things that they see and smells so it's very it feels very fragmented it feels like um you know like they can't figure out what actually is happening but something feels like it's happening right um kids that are really little pre-verbal and they have something like this happen they don't even necessarily have full memory but their body has the memory so they walk around thinking feeling like something is wrong or off but they don't know what it is because they don't have a memory. But there's a constant feeling of dread, of feeling not okay, of feeling um, like something's wrong. Certain people's voices trigger them, and they and they can't put what it is. It's it's like a really scary thing to walk around and not know, like, am I crazy? Like, you know. Um, then there's the whole factor around when it does happen intrafamilial, and you have to really pretend like it didn't. There's a constant questioning: Did this really happen? Right. So there are so many cases of siblings being, um, you know, being abused by siblings and having those, that whole situation around like, well, everything sort of went back to normal, right? After, after the abuse stopped, now we're family members, we're going to Pesach dinner together, we're, we're t you know, so everything sort of has to be okay. So now it's like, did this really happen? Am I making this up? Maybe I'm, maybe it really didn't happen. And that whole crazy making piece. Yeah, that's another defense to. It's a whole other defense, but these are all the pieces that sort of, you know, kind of come in. And, um, you know, there is a whole concept from the Torah concept around, around, um, <coughs> you know, um, around the concept of Eitz Hadas and how, and, and being aware of, our, of, of the body and then starting to have shame around that. And there is, there is something about sexual abuse that really, really kills a person's soul. And the way I see it is that the soul dissociation to me feels like the soul 
is literally like outside of the body, kind of hovering, hovering on the top. And part of what, what when we do some of this work is to try to get that soul back into a person's body. But this is this is how I see it. There's so much damage that happens. Is there also a piece where you just feel? I mean, I, I don't know if you mentioned it, but like the, the piece I've seen a little bit is that you feel like the bad guy in the situation that you weren't a bad guy. You're taking responsibility for a situation where you. Oh, for I, sure, for okay. sure. That's huge because, first of all, predators are great at that, right? I've heard people say. Well, you know, I just woke up and that and that three year old girl had just had her hands down my pants. Like she was starting. Like I'm sure, you know. Right. Or like that girl was um or she was just um or he or she was very provocative, right? She came on to me. I mean, these are adults will say these things with straight faces, right? Like right. totally like and so they're giving over this information to um to children. <laughs> He's freaking out. Are you okay? Yeah, <laughs> um they're giving over this information to to the kid in very, very subtle ways, right? Um, which is one of the concepts we teach in prevention is around talking to kids about tricky people. How do you know who a tricky person is? Well, there are, there are certain ways that tricky people try to either make you break your safety rule, like, ah, don't worry about it, like your mom knows me, she's not gonna care, right? Or like bringing you in, right? Oh my gosh, if you, we better not tell anyone or we're gonna get into such big trouble, we, right? right? And, right? Or like, after something happens, you get a present or you get a pizza, right, or something, and you ate the pizza. Well, you ate the pizza, now you're, now you're like, uh, we're partners, right? And so there are a lot of ways, and kids are really susceptible. A lot of people will say, what do you mean? But the kids should know. I told them that if anyone touches them, they should come tell me, right? This is like every, like, parent in general. They should, of course they would know. My kid would, ne would always tell me, right? What people don't understand is that sexual abuse doesn't happen in this way where somebody just grabs a kid and abuses them. It doesn't work that way. That's like 10% of the cases, which would be strangers, you know, that, you know, that this happens with, it doesn't work that way. It is a process where this person breaks down a child and the family's defenses to get in there so that the kid feels like they totally trust this person. And, but, and then they start very slowly. Um, you know, asking them to keep a little secret. Oh, your mom said you can't have Coke after dinner and I'm watching you right now, but you know what, just don't tell, just don't tell because you know, you really deserve the Coke and she won't let me watch you anymore. Tiny thing, right? Just a cup of Coke, right? But then the next secret and the next, and then by the time you hit the, 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 this piece, it's like, well, you didn't tell, you didn't tell all those things. Oh gosh, mom's going to be so mad at you. You've been keeping so many things from her. Mm -hmm. This is how ki kids are not mini adults. This is how they think, right? Um, you know, you came, you came back to my house again, right? This happened once, right? And now you came back again. You came to my room again. Like, you knew this was going to happen, right? You obviously wanted it, right? Okay? And kids will start to think that, right? Or once it happens, they can't tell, right? Like, um, it's if I if it happened once and I didn't tell, how can I tell again a month later? Because I didn't tell a month ago. Right. I'm stuck. So it happens very, very often, and predators know it. They're really, really good at it. Um, well, let me ask a question. Yeah. How many times, are there any research on how many people report as opposed to not report to, let's say, their parents? Oh, or it's very, it's very, very low. Reporting is really low. It's getting better. You should just know, by the way, all the, the numbers of, of the more, um, the reporting, COVID messed it up a little. I'm not so talking about police reporting. Yeah, no, to the parents. Yeah, right. yeah. Disclosures have really, you know, have gotten, gone up for sure to parents. Um, it was steadily happening and like, and, and abuse reports were going down. Um, COVID messed us up a little for many reasons, so I'm not gonna include that right now because it's like a whole world in of itself. But um, in general, prevention is wor was working, is working, right? There's a lot of talking about this topic, a lot, a lot more than we ever had before. And one of the things I think that it's so important for people to, to understand is that the research shows that when a child knows that there is somebody to tell, and knows that this person's gonna believe them, their PTSD is 10 times less than really? somebody not. Yes. The biggest factor is being able to know that somebody's gonna show up, which goes back to your concept of, of the village and having support, which is why the whole concept of the community rallying for predators becomes so much more painful than ha sometimes even the abuse itself. Because it's all connected in this in this way, right? The biggest factor for for PTSD is not being believed, is not having anyone to tell, is nobody being there. So if you're watching on social media that all these guys are being protected or on the news or whatever, then you're like, 
nobody's going to do anything for me anyway. Of course. Of course. I'm actually having this experience. Uh, I, I kind of jokingly said I'll bring a Flatbush girl because uh, <laughs> everybody loves to hate me about that. Yeah. But uh, I'm having that experience because I came out going, this is disgusting, you know, people hold withholding gets or whatever. And, and the amount of, like, hate. hate. I'm not really getting it from any women. It's basically men. Mm -hmm. um, I just can imagine a woman who's actually going through this going, no one's got my back. Right. Because no one got my back. Right. And I just said, I just did a thing with Chachmat Nashim. You know yeah, that? Yeah, sure, they're amazing. Shana Jasko, Mr. Amazing, yeah, yeah. She'll be on my pod soon, which is very excited, hopefully. Yeah. But she's doing amazing work. And But, I mean, it was, I made like a video for her. And the amount of like, wow, a man have to send, and I, I'm so confused by it. I know. Because I'm like, why am I the only man making a video? It's like only women are going to talk about like people getting hurt. And, and this is what the topic. It's like it's this gaslighting experience. Like I'm, I went through something. They tell me I was told in one class that they would take care of me. But I'm watching the news. Yeah. The men don't care about this topic. Right. I'm talking about a different topic. Right. But I'm saying. But, and, so, and think about what you're feeling and what these women are feeling. And these are adults. Right. So think about a child. Child. Right. There's just no way. There is no way. That a child can come forward if they don't believe that there's somebody there that's going to actually believe them and help them. There is no way because it does really feel like a life threat, and and I think people have to understand this. There, it really feels like that. Like, what do you mean that it really does feel like that? Like their life will be over, and the truth is, in a lot of communities, their life will be over because think about it. If a child says to a parent, like you know cousin so-and-so or uncle so-and-so or aunt so-and-so is doing this, well, what's going to happen by the next Hanukkah party? What's going to happen by the next family wedding? How do we navigate this? Everything changes. And the child knows it, and they know it because the predator makes sure they know it. And so kids are not stupid. And so for the, that's why one of the reasons why I do, from with, my, with Magino, I do um, the school system a lot. I push for prevention in the school system because I really believe just based on all the research, that the school system is a huge component in the kid's life because after a mom, the number two person a child is likely to disclose to is a teacher. Really? Yeah. And if you think about it, it makes sense because we just said most abuse is happening in the homes, right, by family members and people that they are with, which makes the school the safest place to disclose to because if it's the mom's brother or the father's you know, sister – it's going to be easier to tell a teacher who's talking about this topic, who's giving prevention out there, who's saying it's not your fault and like learning about this kind of, these kind of topics, than it's going to be to tell your parent who you know loves their sibling. Right? It's, it's very complicated, and this is not to blame parents in any way. I think parents have a huge, um, amazing ability to help kids you know, be okay and be able to talk about things, but it's not a one-time conversation, and it's not just a body boundary conversation. You, know, you can tell the kids body safety rules, but that's not what it is because most of the people I treat have said, yeah, my parents have told me no one's allowed to touch you. It's not like they never, never told that. It still happened anyway. Right. And they usually didn't even tell their parents. That's right. And they still didn't even tell, even sitting there as, an, as a 40, 50 year so old that, person. So to me, that, that statistic, and actually you've told me that maybe in a seminar or something, you're giving or something, but I've heard it from you, and it actually freaked me out the first time I heard it, is that... I've had my kids, I, I remember at one point, my kids, we were going on some trip or something like that, and my wife started saying, like, just so, just so you know that this and that doesn't happen, and and one of my kids is like, I know, if somebody dodged me, and she, like, literally gave the whole speech and, like, rolling their eyes, right? So we said it and said it and said it and said it, and, like, and really did all the prevention we could, and, you know, we're, yeah. we're pretty informed. Yeah. So... When you say everybody you're dealing with, and I see it too, have been told, and, and all this, right. how those people are still not reporting it, still it's happening to them, right. that's more terrifying than anything because now my my next question is, and you're doing Magainu, so like, let's talk about prevention a little bit yeah. because, I mean, I'm I'm sufficiently terrified. You yeah. know, like you, <laughs> yeah. you get you, that was, uh, yeah. it, you know, this last part. Yeah. Um, partially I want to talk about prevention just because, uh, I want to, I want to curl up in a ball and I cry know. right now because to think of people Doing just that, going through this it's in awful. their life is just horrific. Yeah. Um, but, but, and, and, right. and, 
and what are we doing for prevention? And if you tell me prevention partially doesn't work, is terrifying. What do we do for prevention? Okay, what so, is happening? So what do we does, have to do? So prevention does work. It's just a prevention. When people think prevention, they think, oh, yeah, I had the talk with my kid, right? But prevention is much more than that. What right? is it? So before we even say what it is, I want to just put it out there that according to the National Institute for Child Molestation Research on this topic, 95% of abuse is preventable with education. Okay, it's a huge what? number. Yes, which literally is what gives me this drive to keep going because I know, I see it, it's true. Okay, so let's think about what prevention is. Prevention is having, having the ability to understand, A, how predators operate, so you know where to, you know, you know what, you're, what you're kind of looking for, and it's a lot about the parent piece and the teacher piece and the coaches and the gymnastics and the camps and every adult in this child's life understanding how to have healthy boundaries, healthy relationships, understanding what it is to model for kids what's okay and what's not okay so that the kid will be able to gauge when something walks into their life that isn't, okay? I'm asking a lot, but I believe it's possible. I think that when... You know, when we think about the adults in a kid's life and we think about what a kid, who, who a child is involved in throughout their day, right? there are so many instances where children are just, um, you know, from, from when they're little to even through their high school years, they're just, um, they're thought of as like, you know, I can do what I want. I'm a figure of authority and you just have to listen to me. Now, I am not a fan of chutzpah, and I'm not a fan of like, you know, everyone's like, oh, well, the kids are going to do whatever they want, and blah, 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 but that's not what we're saying. We are saying that we can have a child be able to say something that they are not okay with, or asking, finding moments where you can implement consent, right? I tell parents all the time, from the time the kids are little, use ways of building in consent. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean if your child's doing a tantrum and they're laying down in the middle of a supermarket floor, you're not going to be like, is it okay if I pick you up from this, from this aisle? No, because the kid needs to be picked up because they're, you know, someone's going to step on them and whatever. Right? right. But it does mean, you know, oh, you know, you're learning how to put on your shirt yourself. Would you like to do it yourself or would you like me to help you? Right. It's like these moments of like when you can build it. Okay. So it's, you mean yeah. you're empowering them and that's what gives them the ability to shut down other people? So it's, it's a twofold piece. The way, the way I think about prevention is 50-50. It's 50% what you're teaching your kids, and it's, and it's your ability to step into the kid's life 50%. Meaning children will, will, even the most educated child, most likely won't be a match for a predator. Okay, Somebody who's trying to get a kid, they're much better. And kids, you know, think about how hard it is to say no to an adult, even as an adult. Right. Okay? Um, it's tough, right? I, I, I tell this story sometimes because I think it's like a very, it, it, it highlights this piece. I do this for a living. I do prevention. I give talks. I'm a very confident person for the most part. I went for a training once and we had to get into groups, you know, for experientials. And I was sitting there, it was me, this other girl and this guy, an older man. He was like, must've been in his sixties, like, you know, and old school. And at one point he reached over he was doing, and he put his hand on my knee and it was very interesting because I don't think he meant anything by it. I don't think he was predatory. That's not where my mind went. But I was uncomfortable. But I was holding the space of like, should I tell him to remove his hand from my leg? I don't want to, I don't want to make him feel bad. I don't want to cause a scene. How do I save this in a certain way? Like, I really was frozen in that moment and in my head thinking like, what do I do here to make sure he doesn't feel bad? Okay, this was like my mindset. Right. And, as and you're as, an adult. And I'm an adult who's a therapist, who does prevention for a living, okay? And as soon as it was over and he took his hand away, I was so upset at myself, okay? I was really mad at myself. I had to go, I called a friend of mine, a colleague, and I processed the whole thing through. But it really, and I came home, and what did I do? I told my kids the story. I told my kids the story, which is prevention as well, and I explained to them that I literally got frozen in that moment, and I was the whole time uncomfortable. I did not, not only didn't I know how to address it, I couldn't remove myself from the situation. And so, you know, I want you to know, I want you guys to know that that happens. And if it happens to you, I totally get it. And you can always talk, talk to me about it and we can figure out what to do for the next time, right? That's prevention, right? Because it's understanding that these things happen and that this is part of life, right? It's knowing how to use yourself 
and to step into the kid's life. So the concept of even just boundaries, think about the concept of boundaries. How many times do people come over to our kids, especially when they're little, and, you know, reach in, oh, you're so cute, and, like, tap them on the, you know, on the cheek or on their head or, you know, try to, like, be silly or whatever it is. And, and your child is, like, sort of, you see, you can see them pulling back a little. You can watch it. Right. But we don't step in because it's our neighbor, it's our father-in-law, it's our, you know, it's our aunt from Israel, whatever it is. And we are, like, you know, it's okay. We, you know, she, he, you know, oh, they love this person or they're just being silly. Oh, say hello. Right. But the only thing we're teaching our kids then is that not only can't they say anything, but then we're not going to say anything for them either, right? We're just like you know, we're not, we're not. But and there's then, a there's a there's a there's a other side to this, which is, yeah, which is hard for me to swallow. Please, because I, a part of this, you know, yeah. like you said, nothing. You said adverse effects when you were talking about ceremonies. You're talking about there's definitely what was the word you used? It was so nice. Like what are the the, the other factors? Contraindications. Yeah. So one of the contraindications I think of all this work. Yeah. That, you're doing and a lot of other people are doing is I believe, and I don't know if it's true or not, is that we have become very untrusting of extended family. Mm -hmm. Like when I say uncle, literally what comes to everybody's head is creepy uncle. Like there's no, it's crazy because it's my favorite thing to be because you just get to love a kid unconditionally without having a care in the world if they're doing all right or not all right. He's, He's fine. He's perfect. She's fine. They're perfect. It's such a great position to be in. Yeah. And a couple of creepy uncles ruined it for all of us when we know it's all the stepdads. No, I'm kidding. No, there's a couple of creepy <laughs> oh uncles God. that ruined everything. God. You want to make a statement that uh, you don't no, agree no, with no, that? No, I don't. I don't. <laughs> okay. No statement, no statement. <laughs> Fine. Um, no, I love stepdads. Mm-hmm. Some of my best friends are stepdads. Right. Um, so, <laughs> so um, nobody, it's, it's like... Know. Yeah. This is a very, because I'm like going village, 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 village. And the thing is, people yeah. get molested in villages. For sure. So now what do we do? Do we shut down the village? No. Like right now, no. I don't want my kids to ever leave the house ever no. and go to the park ever. So, okay. I totally hear you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I do hear what you're what saying. What do we do about this? And I am not, so it's funny because I'm not anti uh, like connection and that, and I'm also not anti touch. Right. I think people have gotten also a little bit crazy when it comes to touch, even when it comes to like being in a school and not having any teacher or any Rebbe ever touch a kid ever, ever anywhere. I think that's very counterintuitive to what a child needs. Children need a, all of us need a certain amount of touch a day for our nervous systems. Right. So you want the Rebbe to go over and put his hand on the back of the kid, you know, while they're walking so that there's a, there's a connection or on his shoulder. You want the Mora to be able to go over if the kid's crying and, and put her arm around this, uh, around this child and sit and be like, you know, what's going on. You don't, you don't and think about your own kid. Of course you want that. Right. Right. For me, it's understand, it's learning and understanding what does it mean to model healthy boundaries. There is a difference between the uncle who's picking up this kid and tickling them and being silly because you're roughhousing and the kids literally, you see the kid's face, stop, kind of laughing but terror, but laughing but terror, right? right. There's a difference between that and the uncle who says, wait, wait a minute, like before I, you know, before, is it okay if I pick you up right now, right? Okay, we're playing the tickling game. Let's pause for a minute, take a deep breath. Like, do you still want to play? Those are, the, those are the healthy modeling adults that teach kids you matter. I love you. I'm roughhousing with you. It's fun. I'm tickling you. I'm going to pick you up, but I'm also going to check in with you. I'm also going to say, going to listen if you don't want to do that anymore. I'm not going to push my way because I want it. I want that kiss. I want that hug. So I'm going to make this kid hug me. Who Like that is something about us as adults. Do I have healthy internal boundaries? You know how many teachers are in classrooms where they really, really don't, don't understand themselves where they, a child might say something like, you're a terrible teacher, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the teacher gets hurt. And we're human. Okay, we might get hurt, right? Yeah. But at that point, sometimes it's about holding that place of like one second. Let me look. Let me, let me see what's happening. Everybody else in the class is liking my lesson, right? Um, I have, I'm teaching for whatever amount of time. I know I'm a good teacher. What's going on with this kid? This kid doesn't like me as a teacher. Maybe they just don't like me as a teacher, right? And I'm not going to get along with every single person. Or maybe something's going on with that kid that morning. Maybe I need to, like, address something else. Like, it's not necessarily about me, right? It might be about them. And so the only way to know that is to have good internal boundaries. I'm okay. What's going on with 
you, right? And let's figure that out instead of just screaming and yelling and kicking a kid out and, and, you know, and, 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 right? These are like these tiny things. I believe all these things are prevention. It's wild because I, we, I, we went on a, I made a joke. We went on a flight uh, yesterday with a, you know, a lot of people. I was together with a lot of people on a flight. And then this woman who maybe worked for the flight or maybe didn't, she turned out she worked for the flight. <laughs> right. But she says, everybody move to the left, move to the left. And she was, you know, she was like, and we, we all just like moved to the left, you know? And I'm like, that's how all the Jews got killed. No, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm like, that's how it happened, folks. Right. We have no idea. And if they have a uniform, we for sure listen. Right. So it's wild that you're trying to teach these boundaries to kids when we can't even do it at all. Right. Your story is like, holy right. cow. Right. I mean, if there's anybody to say, get your hand, you know, it should be you. That's right. That's right. So it's so that's why I say 50-50. Because as an adult, you have to really think, are you ready? Are you prepared to step in, to step in for your kid without without investigating and without accusing, but just to step in for them and be uncomfortable? Can I be uncomfortable for a few minutes so that my com my kid doesn't have to be uncomfortable for a lifetime? That's really what you're saying here. That's what it is. Think about it like this. Um, I have a I had another piece, right? I had um I have a lot of you know I have a lot of people by me for all the meals for holidays and Shabbosim, right? All the time. Um, and I'm very careful around that. I have a lot of rules for my kids around all these pieces. We set things up in advance. It's not that you can't do it, guys. You can do it. You just have to set up rules in advance of how to do it and how to make kids safe in the household. Um, and at one point, I had this guy over for a lot of the meals. And he, I don't think he was in his 30s. I'm not even sure. Very nice person, but a little socially, you know, not, I don't know, something was, something was a little off. Um, and very uh, playful and loud and was trying very, talking to my younger my youngest a lot now not we were by a table of a lot of people it wasn't alone right but like and my I, i'm watching my child and i see her body language right she's not comfortable mm. how, how could you know that you know when your kid's uncomfortable right there's a there's a way that they pull back they're looking away they're like a little more clingy to us as parents and so i said to her come sit next to me you stay with me and at one point I went to the kitchen to get to serve food and I heard, I was like listening and I heard him say to her, oh, you know, do you want to play back, Ammon? Like, why don't you, let's play a game. Now, the game was to be played at the table in front of everybody. So do I think this person was trying to do anything? It's not where my mind goes, although people, I'm sure people think that's always where my mind goes. It actually wasn't. But what my mind did go to was my kid didn't want to, but she wouldn't necessarily be able to say no. Right, so I went in and I just said, hey, you know, it's so nice that you want to play a game, a game with her, but in our family, adults play with the adults and children play with the children, right? Was it the most comfortable thing for me to do? No, but did I do it? Yes, because she couldn't do it and that's my job. That is my job. So this is, this is what I'm talking about. When we talk about prevention, it's a lot of different pieces. Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe the children, I have a full kids program for nursery up to eighth grade. And there was a full place where the children should learn all these different aspects of how to deal with their feelings and having trusted adults in their life and body safety rules and secrets and all the, all the things. But then the parents need to have education around how to build this in slowly, drop at a time, drop at a time. And the teachers have to understand how to talk to the kids and model for the kids and how to build boundaries into their lives, right? right. And then hopefully everyone else around them as we go, will trickle, will trickle, be a trickle effect. That's my, that's my hope. Right. Because if we build a community where kids can come forward, instead of holding the secret, it's it's a world of difference. It's a world. And you're saying that actually has been happening. Yes, it has been happening. I see it more and more. That gives me a lot of hope. Yeah. Because I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't be doing this by the way if I didn't see it actually happening. I don't think I'd be able to do this because it would be too painful. Right. But I do really, really do see shifts and changes so many people are reaching out and calling yeah yes with cases right so it's sad but they're calling that's already huge they're catching it the kids are saying things they're playing things out which already is huge because you're stopping something from being then a year year years and years long of abuse as opposed to that one time that something comes out right, right? um well i yeah. also find something interesting okay they yeah. i always have two things Maybe I just do one at a time. One of them, the first thing is that I've noticed when I deal with someone who's 
and who's like traumatized, but you're hearing the story and you just feel like there's more to this, there's way more to this. Very, very often I have found that not only were they molested, but they have also acted out maybe to a younger sibling with the same thing. I have found that has, I don't know, it's exponential type of trauma. I, I'm not yeah. very informed that. And the problem is, is that they're the predator now. Like we use the word predator and now they're the predator and they're the monster that they're terrified of. Right. And I don't know if very you have any thoughts cool. on that because those those people seem to suffer forever. Very much. It's a, it's a, it's a big suffering. Um, but again, this is, so this is, so here's, so okay, so this is a little complicated because when it yeah. comes to the concept of offenders, um, which by the way, just as a plug, right, May 2nd, if people go on the website, they'll yeah. see doing a, um, doing a full workshop with a criminologist and a play therapist who deals with sexual trauma to address a lot of these kinds of pieces around different kinds of offenders and how this works and, and what about the adolescent offender, how, how, what's the differences? There are, a, there's so much information around this. Um, so thinking about this, most parents, when their child is molested, are really afraid that their child will become a molester. Yeah, because we think that, one of the things we always think is that molesters were, always, were molested. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually not true. It's something that we, we think, but um, most molesters, when they're caught, they'll say they were molested because it's like an empathy piece, but it's not really true. Really? It, right, Do yes, you have the really. statistics of that or? Um, it's researched, I'm just quote, quoting research, and, and you'll hear if you listen to this criminologist who worked with criminals, these, these offenders for 30 years, that's what he'll tell you. The it's, details it's, you need this. Exactly. It's May 2nd. May 2nd, yeah. Online. Online, we'll, we'll share a link. Yeah, we'll share a link and you can sign up, yeah. Um, so that's something important for, for people to know. Now, the, the difference between that and a, and a child, a child who's molested and then acts out, is that a child is not a molester, right? They're not, they're not a molester, they're not a pedophile, they're acting out what they experienced, right? Because right? kids do that with everything, right? They model everything, right? If you want to know what's happening in your child's day in school, play school and let your kid be the teacher. You'll know everything that's happening in school, right? That's a good idea. Yeah. Too late. My Too kids late. are out of school. <laughs> <laughs> but, kids, right, but kids will model, right? They, they model, they learn by modeling. So if somebody, if they were molested, there's a chance, you know, a higher chance that they're going to act out on another kid what they've experienced, right? in no way, shape, or form is that child a molester, right? The kid that was is being hurt could probably have the same symptoms as a, you know, trauma symptoms as if it was somebody else, a, an yeah. adult, right? So that child really needs proper help and not to be minimized or invalidated, but this other child also needs the help because they're acting out, right? So that's the same thing for when, when kids sometimes become teenagers, you know, teenagers, are a little bit of a different world because sometimes it's acting out based on their own experience. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just a lot of sexual curiosity with no, no education and they're, they don't know what to do with themselves and so they're acting out on those closest to them, which would be a sibling, right? right. And so it's kind of this, this happens. Um, and sometimes it's that in a, fam in, a, in a lot of families where there's a lot of um, neglect or um, parents that are not are are, you know, abusive in some other way. Very oftentimes, siblings will get will come together and really rely on each other, and be very very close. And oftentimes, it turns sexual, and that happened in those kinds of families. And then they, everyone carries the shame and the guilt around this for years, and and this is part of the process of un of like unpacking what's going on and where it came from. You can hold space for the fact that you did something to your sibling. Right, that wasn't okay, and that really hurt them, and that you were really hurt, and that's where it came from. Right, right? Um, or my parents weren't, you know, weren't there for me, and this is where it went, and then had to make amends, you know, for all those pieces, and th that's just part of the part of the therapy process. But, but one thing I think people need to understand also is that if you discover that your teenager um, has acted sexually out on on somebody, ignoring it pretending it's just like, oh, this is just normal behavior in the sense that he just made a mistake, he says he'll never do it again, um, is not the answer. Because most teenagers, when they get into the proper help for people that deal with this, mm -hmm. their rate of reoffending is super, super low. But only if they're in the proper help, they could be totally fine. But if they don't get the help, it's a world of 
pain, confusion, potentially continuing this kind of behavior, like a sexual motivation is, is huge, right? So once that happens. So right. what age do you get to where all of a sudden you're like, you're a molester, <laughs> say it another way, like yeah. you're an adult. We just, I, I don't know if you watched the um, interview with the child molester, I, I think you did and you were very upset about yeah, it. Yeah, I was upset about um, it. With yeah. uh, Mandy Palin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I had mixed feelings about that because I, th I think probably educated a tremendous amount of the world about how sick this is and now where it is. Mm -hmm. But I think he was in his own sick way re reenacting this whole it's thing. And yeah, yeah. it was pretty creepy. Holy cow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know. He felt like getting into the mind of a murderer. Like you're like, yikes. Right. Uh, but I, right, so, I thought it was like yeah. to see that. Um, it, so I, there was some good effect. But what I was like, the reoffending thing. Yeah. Like, I, I don't understand how adults are attracted to kids because I just can't conceive it. Like, I, I'm like, in my brain, I can't do that for some reason. I don't that's get good. it. But that's good. Okay. Yeah, but that, right. But that, that's what people say all the time. I don't get it. And I was. I like, really don't get but it. But that's a good thing. If you don't, you're not, you're not supposed to get it, right? It's, it's a right. deviance. It's something like, if you don't get it, it means you're healthy. Right? So how many people as adults? Too many. You, what what's the numbers like how many people find children attractive so i don't know the numbers here they did it there was a recent study that was done in australia and um it was it was pretty intense i don't remember the exact numbers but i think they were finding like one in six men were saying they were attractive to children this was a study out of oh australia my God. i know i, I want to stop terrible. the pod right now i want to throw up know, it's horrible. this is true this is a study okay it was, it's it was a, a study and it was a study in australia so it's a very specific pool and we you know we, we can't generalize the pool to everything else but it's um but it's something that uh that's out there okay um we do know that somebody who becomes a pedophile who is a pedophile right um when do they know they're a pedophile from teenagehood right the second we as as teenagers are attracted to girls or boys right, right. it's the same kind of thing that happens. so you're but you are saying that there are sometimes teenagers that are times. that are acting out more of the Ooh, this is such an interesting car like i have a thing with teenagers and that are addicted technically they are, they're, they're acting like addicts mm -hmm. but then they just stop at 19 20 they just stop and everybody's like whoa you know and we're throwing everybody in rehab at nine you know what i'm saying like let's get him at the rehab right. like he did a drug once so and i'm like well, let's wait to see if they really have this this addiction at this level you're saying it's somewhat similar with offenders like there are people that have like experimented but that's not really what they're attracted to well think about it like this if 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 a teenager is, is starting to you know kind of develop sexually and they start to usually they'll have this attraction right they're looking at girls or they're looking at boys right that's how this is natural how this happens right right if a teenager is um looking at girls i actually um uh, one of the uh, i read this whole um sort of thing from a specific predator who was saying how how did he know that he was that he was a pedophile because when he was a teenager he had found himself right he was attracted he first when he was younger first he was finding let's say this like these little these kids let's say attractive or whatever it was and, and as he was getting older they weren't getting older right the, the people that he, the the kids that he was being attracted to were, were the same age and he started to realize right there's something it's not like he's starting to be attracted to his peers he's attracted to younger kids right now there are also a lot of um people out there that can be they're attracted to could be in a relationship with adults too that's why most we find right when people all the pedophiles that we know of are married right so right. so they have a relationship with an adult but um you'll and and again we can there's a lot to talk about with this which is why i'm doing this thing on may 2nd because um graham hill he'll tell you a lot of this kind of these kind of pieces around the concept of of, of being a predator against kids is not about let's say sex the it's usually to fill a primary intrinsic need and sex is secondary so they're trying to fill something power and control, love and nurturing, something, and sex is secondary. So there's a, there's a so much to know and learn around this. And again, I don't expect everyone to know and learn about this. Right. Obviously, clearly it's very tough and that's why I'm doing, I'm doing it. Um, I'm doing an, actually another master's because I'm a glutton for punishment in forensic psychology on offenders. Oh, wow. Because it, the more I know, the more it informs my prevention. Um, so, so wait, so you're saying, yeah. sorry, I'm, I'm yeah, cutting yeah. you off. Well, I don't mean to cut no, you off. No, but are you saying that 
that there's a way to have someone who's highly attracted to children sexually to work with them that they'll get to a place where they'll understand that they don't have to fill that need because it's not primarily sexual that they could actually like stop them from doing this again and again and again i mean so is there that's the whole that's the whole concept of um of treatment do i believe that treatment helps for predators i think it can and also it doesn't there well are, what are the neighbor know? what are the numbers saying sorry um what are the numbers saying it's a good question i don't know okay. i actually don't know the research on that tell I those people may 2nd they have to have the answer may 2nd. Be so way. it's funny because so 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 you know this guy dr graham hill who is a criminologist does not he says straight up that treatment is not a cure um there's no cure and that it's more about um management you know like it's there it's like in a, in a way like a little bit of a management please but right. i've spoken to um other people that work with offenders that will say that you know after treatment they really are okay so i believe that there must be something in the middle where it's about more about like what the risk factors are there are people that are high risk people that are low risk people that are medium risk i think it all depends on where this is coming from right. um and you know in terms of the even the legal the justice system once a, once um somebody once somebody is convicted and spends time in jail for this which is a whole you know you know till they get to that point forget it but let's say they get into they're in jail and they're finishing their sentence at that point um the the court petitions for them to have either either civil commitment because they say they're still a danger to society so now they have to be civilly committed where they're still in jail even though they finished their sentence they're just in in a hospital setting okay getting treatment but they're away or they're under supervision which is they have to meet with a supervisor a certain amount of times a month um, like a parole officer kind of person and they have to you know only do certain jobs they have to be in certain it's like a very like you know kind of specific way of, of managing right. and which one works and there's all this research on how this is better or that's better and this is really just more jail time and that right it's it's a whole world to talk about that but what what we do know is that the more isolated perpetrators are the more likely they are to to uh to commit acts of perpetration against children oh my gosh so here's so right so this, <laughs> right, this is really tough right because if you think about this, yeah in the so what i gotta like, do right like if bring we them really to the community wanna, so it's kind of like this kind of thing of like if we really if we really care about protecting kids we have to think about all these factors otherwise we're not we're missing puzzle pieces right meaning should they be in the shul where there's a bunch of kids not without a safety circle not without somebody specifically knowing that they shouldn't be hanging out by the kiddush alone, right? Or they should be diving in an adult-only minion, right? But because we don't talk about this as a topic, we can't help it. This is like my biggest thing. It's like we have to be able to say like this is something. Right? This is this is something. So how do we manage it, right? If we don't want to kick that person out, maybe that maybe there's a you know. Can we maybe, make a community for molesters that there are no kids. You move in there. So you move. So they have that in. Do they uh, have that? They have those in like in Florida. They have some communities. Um, like where where they, they once they get released from jail, they have to go to certain a certain building or certain places and live in certain communities. Oh. And that's a, probably also a monitoring thing. And I think. Okay, I'm like, I'm cutting you off. I'll yeah, tell you why. So you ready? I know, yeah. Here's the question. Yeah. Here's the real question. I'm I am I'm sitting here listening to this for for, for a while. Yeah. We'll okay. get to that. You're I'm right sitting here listening to this. Yeah. I'm. I'm uh I'm dying. Mendy is in much worse shape. He's 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 losing it. First of all, you should be taking a picture of us. Just okay, good. Right? Social media guy. All right. Awesome. So um, it's very scary. My producer yes. is, is 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 jumping at yeah. Like we're we're not in this topic as I I, it's funny because we are, but we're not. Um, and I'm in it somewhat. My skin is crawling. I am activated. I'm. I know that I'm going to go eat a big fat meal afterwards just to <laughs> right. feel a little bit better. Right, right. Um, how the heck are you? I mean, you mentioned it before, but like, how are you surviving? I, if I had to do, you do full days of this, yeah, and then weeks, and then months. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you? How, how is this? You you threw it in there like I could do this, but right. how the how heck? How do I do it? Okay, so it's a great question. Um, I'll tell you how I do it. Yeah, I really, really focus on what can be done and not the what can't be done. Meaning, I'm very focused on the fact that I believe very strongly 
that if everybody took responsibility for their part of their world of education in, in how they are interacting with kids, whether it's a parent, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a counselor, we can shift so many of these cases. We can really lower the numbers. Now, I don't think we'll get rid of this. I don't think we're gonna save every kid. I wish, but I don't think so. But I do believe that there are so many cases that will be lowered just by everybody learning just little bits of how to educate themselves and their children around these topics. It's not to be afraid of this discussion. It might be yucky. And we're talking about, what we're talking about is really in-depth, um, you know, really yucky. I don't expect these two neighbors to be talking about this topic like we're talking about it. Right. But I do expect if one person calls over the other, the other kid for a play date, the mom to call up or the father to call up and say, hey, you know, you invited my kid for a play date. I just want to kind of ask a few questions first. You know, are, is there any, um, do you have any older kids in the house? Is there any uh, internet that's unfiltered? Who's going to be watching the kids? What are your rules around the kids being, and I know in my house, I don't allow closed doors while they're playing. What happens for you? And if the other parent says, oh, you're being so silly, like you really worry about this kind of stuff. That's like not a big deal. I wouldn't send my kid to that house. I would maybe have them by my house but I wouldn't send them over to that house. Right. I'm looking for, for parents. I'm looking for, you know, I had a preschool a director say once to me, oh, oh, that doesn't, no, we're a Jewish school. That doesn't happen here, okay? Those answers terrify me because right. if you don't even know to look, you're never going to see. So I don't expect parents and, and regular people and everybody to be talking about the way we're talking about it, but I do expect them to know that when they have a gut feeling that somebody's acting a little bit off, or, you know, they seem to be paying a lot of attention to this kid. Or this kid seems to have a lot of gifts that they're bringing home that we don't really know where it came from, right? Or all of a sudden, this child starts to have a change in behavior that's very abnormal after he started doing lessons in this place that we start to ask important questions, that we ask the right questions, and that we're okay with whatever we get as an answer. That any kid can say anything and that we know I, I can, okay, here's who I call, let's figure this out together. Because to me, that's, I believe in healing. I said, I don't believe this is a death sentence. It's a terrible thing, but there are plenty of people who go through this that are perfect, they're, fun, they're good. They're married, they have kids, or they have good jobs, or they're living their life in a regular, healthy way. Um, you know, they suffer in, uh, in a lot of ways, but we all suffer to a certain extent, right. right? You can be okay. This isn't like a, you know, Oh no, we found this out. That's another piece. The whole okay, so actually, right? that is that is the cool thing. You're yeah. saying the numbers, yeah. And I'm like, there's something very exciting about the numbers, even though it's horrible numbers. Right. One in four women, you know, having gone through this in their childhood, one in six men. I it's crazy, yeah. but I could tell you that there there must be an enormous amount of resilience in this world because not one in four women are like curled up in a ball and not right. functioning. Yeah. Most women are doing fine and sense? most men are doing fine. And there's a small percentage of people that are really, really, really suffering to the point of like they can't function. So oh, yeah. last piece on this. Yes. I think how could we help build resilience for people that they that we could get those numbers even higher? Like, I, I think we're not doing that bad. I mean, to say it that way. No, I think, I'm very, I think we're I think people are amazing. Yeah. So how do we build resilience? How do we how do we do that? And yeah. what are those people? I actually have said this many times. It's like when people tell me that trauma causes all this stuff, I'm like, Shkaych, I know that. Let me ask you about the people who had the trauma and are doing all right. right. What did they do? Because I want to analyze that because that's what I want to do. I mean, the whole Our Village is based on what builds what works, resilience. Right. right. And where it's a funny thing I said a long time ago because people got upset that I used, you know, they kept saying, using the word and I'm enabling, I'm enabling. So I put the, the word underneath our place on our letterhead for a while without anybody noticing. <laughs> I wrote enabling. our place, enabling resilience. Yeah. And I was just like, <laughs> and joking. no one knew. I was like my little secret joke. They're like, yeah, awesome. I'm, I'm enabling. Yeah. Um, but that's what I want to know is like, what does it take? to be a resilient person that even if trauma comes your way, I could function. What do you think about that? I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a wonderful way to look like a, it's a great lens. I think that, um, you know, when you sit with people that have gone through the worst that people can do to other people and also see the most, um, spectacular ways that people survive, um, 
even addictions, right? Addictions, uh, suicidality, all the behaviors that come up with this stuff, those behaviors alone got them through. They're, it's pretty amazing that they're sitting here today because all that stuff got them here. Right. That's amazing, right? Um, I think there's, to me, it's all about education. I really believe it's, an, to me, it's education in the sense that when, when everybody can sort of take a minute and just learn tiny bits around how can you show up for another person, right? Like letting go a little bit of ego and knowing everything to being to like, what can I learn from this other person? To me, that is everything because when somebody feels like they can't tell anyone, when they can't be themselves, when there's a terror around the fallout, who am I going to marry? Nobody's going to want me. Um, how am I going to have keep this job? Right? Nobody could ever know. I'll be thrown out of the family. That is that is the killer. That is the point where people don't want to be in their communities anymore. They're running. They're looking. Right? That is what happens. So that's our fault. Right? That's not the person who was hurtful. That's that's our fault. The way we look at things, the way we talk about things, even around people that are offenders. Right. I have to say, listen, I I work with a lot of stuff. I, I offenders. It's ugh, right. But right. offenders are not all one thing. They're not right. all one thing. Everybody, every offender has family. Yeah. Right. So nobody's all one thing. We have to really be able to ask the proper questions, build in the proper like protective factors, minimizing risk, optimizing safety, you know, learning as much as we can, and then being being open to like whatever I, I might have made, I might have said that, I might have done that a little bit wrong. You know, what what's going to be what can I do differently? What can I teach? You know, to me, it's if edu it's education and awareness and what you can do. Because right. if I focus on the can't, I'm I'm dead. I wouldn't get out of bed. Well, I would add to that. I uh, I'm in my own experience again, community and building huge support networks around people. Like that's my thing. Right. But I like I like what you're saying. Okay, so final question. Yeah. Rooftop rooftop question. Rooftop. Yelling to the world from the rooftop, like what? What? Oh, what is God. your message that you want to get out to the world? You said a lot of messages. Yeah. You, you could get out of it, but like, what's a well, message? message? You're just frustrated. You want to get it out there. Like, what is? It's it's Every single hard. podcast is uh, more popular than the last, so it wow. could be millions of people listening. Oh God, to no, pressure. no pressure. No pressure. Just don't worry, millions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding about the millions. <laughs> Mandy would be happy, yeah. but I think the message would be for 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 us all as a as the hum as humans to recognize that you know bad things can happen, right? And that it's okay to look at those things and to learn what to do about those things. And to then move to the next step and the next step and the next step and not to get try not to get stuck along the way, right? I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to look at this. This is too complicated. It doesn't happen here. It happens in the religious community. It oh, it happens in the modern community. No, it only happens with those those Sephardim. No, no, for sure it doesn't happen there. It happens only with the Ashkenaz. Like everybody needs to to take a breath. It happens everywhere because humans it happens to, and just to to try to learn from people that that study this kind of stuff right don't don't be alone don't don't do this on your own right i am constantly learning um from everybody around me and and that goes back to your community piece we are a community and we need to we need to support each other in in everything not just in not not pick and choose what we think is the right cause you know it's amazing i'm gonna i'm gonna finish on that because i love it <laughs> i i thank you so much for coming that was awesome. It was my pleasure. You really slept out here. And I, you definitely, you won the award of the most uncomfortable I felt <laughs> during a podcast. Because yeah. we're talking about yeah. such tough stuff. But I really think it's so important yeah. to look at this. Because if I'm in this and I have such a hard time looking at it, yeah. and it's probably not a mistake that it took a half hour to get to it, I, as a therapist, I think it's right. very possible. It, it took me a half hour <laughs> yeah. to get the guts to go into it. But I think I, what I love is that I feel like you have a really hopeful message and you're not jaded. And I, I love that. Yeah. It's, I, I definitely get jaded sometimes. And to be in the work of helping people the best you can and to still feel positive and hopeful, it's beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for this day that I've been given. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for this chance. Thank you for this chance to live a new.